House Speaker Mike Johnson unveiled a Republican-led foreign aid package yesterday. According to three sources familiar with the process, the legislation would include three aid measures with roughly tens of billions of dollars for Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan, and allies in the Indo-Pacific. A fourth measure would include national security priorities, such as seizing Russian assets in the U.S., a loan lease program for Ukraine, and additional sanctions on Iran. Johnson says his preference is to vote on each bill individually, but will let the chamber decide. There are precipitating events around the globe that we're all watching very carefully, and we know that the world is watching us to see how we react. Um, we have uh, terrorists and tyrants and terrible leaders around the world like Putin and Xi and, uh, and in Iran, and they're watching to see if America will stand up for its allies and in our own interest around the globe, and we will. Well, uh, but they haven't. I, I'm very glad he said that. Uh, and uh, hope that he actually comes through with, with a clean aid bill to Ukraine. They haven't said it, but they, they, they're talking about it now. What's it look like, Richard? Look, uh, I don't much care whether it's a combined bill or, or a, you know, a separate bill, so long as the aid for Ukraine passes. That's the most pressing of all of that. Right. Uh, and you know, every day the battlefield news, Joe, is is awful strategically, but also in human terms. The idea that you have these soldiers on the front lines who simply maybe have a half dozen shells and they have to parcel them out to get through a day. You can't fight a war that way. And it's tilting in Russia's favor. This is recklessness and irresponsibility on steroids that we've ever reached this 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 point. I'm hoping, and again, to me, it doesn't matter so much whether it's loans or grants. Just get Ukraine the military aid more and sooner. You know, there's obviously going to be a compromise here. There'll be less than Ukraine wants and needs, arguably. It's obviously been later. Some of the economic terms won't be as generous. But right. if that's the price of getting it, let's pay the price. Let's bring in Admiral James Trevitas. He's a former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, retired four-star Navy Admiral, and the international analyst for NBC News. Admiral, your thoughts on this aid? Uh, I'm with Richard. Get it done. And frankly, it doesn't matter whether it's linked together, although I can make a pretty good argument that they all kind of fit together. But at this point, uh, without question, the, the racehorse that needs to be in the pole position is Ukraine. Look, the Israelis are not going to be defeated by Hamas. Uh, certainly, China is a longer term problem. The one that really matters now, now, now is getting the aid to Ukraine. It's a military imperative. The only bright spots in Ukraine are the hits against the Russian Black Sea fleet at sea have been quite effective. Mm -hmm. Other than that, the Ukrainians are on their back foot, both in the air and on the land. Good news, they're going to add F-16s over the next couple of months, but that will not tip this balance without the bread and butter of hardcore ammunition for the battlefield, particularly artillery shells. Got to get done. And, and final thought, uh, to draw a line under something the speaker said, which is the world is watching. It yeah. is watching. It is watching, and it's, it's this is good news, Jonathan, obviously, if the aid gets to our allies, but it's a little rich for a lot of Democrats who've been making this exact argument for months and months and months now, which is Beijing is watching what we do in Ukraine. Mike Johnson, who stood in the way of a lot of this aid, is now making those same arguments, saying, also, the munitions are being made in America. We've been saying on that show, Admiral Stavridis has been saying on this show for months and months and months. So, Speaker Johnson, coming around late to all the cases that people have been making, for foreign aid to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. Yeah, he's coming around late. And also, this is far from a sure thing to get right. to get done yeah. here. First of all, the, the fourth bill, we don't know much about yet. It's still being worked out. It's going to include a package of uh, related measures, potentially a ban on TikTok, seizing assets from Russian oligarchs in the U.S., and so on. Um, but... The White House deeply opposes this idea. The whole point was to combine this, thinking that it would have a better chance to get Ukraine funding through if it was attached to Israel. Certainly right now, Israel has a lot of momentum in the wake of this weekend's attacks, but a lot of those on the right are still opposing the Ukraine aid. And it's not clear that Johnson has the votes. Uh, a number of Republicans are still opposed to this. And in order to placate some of the hard right Republicans, even if he's able to get their support in the House, it's probably going to mean including provisions 
that are non-starters in the Senate, so that they're going to have to go back there. And that seems uh, pretty dire that that could get done. And lastly, the fact that Johnson's even taking this step is endangering his speakership. So I guess credit to him for doing that, that Marjorie Taylor Greene raged afterwards about this, declaring it a betrayal. Yeah, but, she, but, 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 but again, you, you said hard to write. You can't even say that anymore. Willie, when when members of the the Republican House GOP are saying they're Putin propagandists, leaders of the Republican Party's foreign policy apparatus inside the House are saying they have become dupes to Russian disinformation. Or I don't know, are they dupes? Are what? I, I, why why would somebody from Northern Georgia start spouting? Russian propaganda points. She's not a dupe, is she? Why, why would I'm just curious. Why would other members of the House Republican Party start spouting Russian propaganda? I don't have any answers to this, though I am fascinated by it. I know there's been some talk in Russia that actually, I mean, some talk in Europe that some European politicians have actually been on the take from Russia. That explains that. I don't understand, though, why politicians from Dalton, Georgia, hmm. are spewing talking points from Vladimir Putin and RT. Russian television. Very, very strange times when, I'm not saying this, I'm quoting the Republican who runs the Intel Committee, yeah. who's saying this. I'm quoting the Republican who runs the Foreign Affairs Committee for saying this. Very strange times indeed in the Republican House. Mike Turner, the chair of the Intel Committee, a Republican, said publicly in an interview on CNN last week, he hears direct Russian propaganda from the mouths of the Republicans on the floor of the House. That's from him. He's a Republican talking about his colleagues there. And it is, uh, it is a fair question. What, why? Why? What, what is, what's going on? And by the way, you could take that argument as we have for I don't, almost a decade now all the way to the top. Why does Donald Trump defend Vladimir Putin at every turn? We've never fully gotten to the bottom of that, but it does seem many of his minions in the House are following his lead on that. Yeah. Richard, why? Look, we have been debating that for, uh, what, 10 years now? No, but I, I know, I know. But, but, but now you have the, the, for, the Ray, Ronald Reagan's former party yeah. uh, being run uh, by some... Why? By, by a speaker who has been worried about Russian propagandists. Again, Russian propagandists, according to the head of the House GOP Intel So let's talk Committee. about a couple of reasons. One is the isolationism in the Republican Party, as you know now, is powerful. The virus has come out, and it's got a lot of political appeal. There's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the support for Republicans, particularly in the South, there's white Christians. A lot of support there for Russia. You see the websites there, a lot of overlap, uh, a lot of support, almost visceral support for, for Putin and Putinism. An inability to support anything that has that Joe Biden wants. If Joe Biden wants it, Republicans have to oppose it. And I can come up with lots of reasons. Bottom line is, Joe, it risks American national security. These people, they use the word patriot 24-7. This is about as unpatriotic as you get. No, unless you're talking about Russian patriotism. Yeah. Literally yes. spewing Russian propaganda talking points, according to the GOP intel chief and the head of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House Republican Party. It is a strange number one Why? issue. Why is this her Why? number one issue? Why? I don't have that answer. I don't understand. Perhaps Why? we'll find out. Perhaps we'll find <laughs> it's out. It's bizarre. Joining us now, former litigator and MSNBC legal correspondent Lisa Rubin and former U.S. attorney and MSNBC contributor Chuck Rosenberg. Also with us, president of the National Action Network and host of MSNBC's Politics Nation, Reverend Al Sharpton. He's with us as well. Lisa, we'll start with you. You were in the courtroom. Uh, aside from the historic aspect of this event yesterday, if you could break down the major developments in the first day legally for us. Mika, one of the biggest things that happened yesterday, and really, truthfully, what consumed the most amount of time was the pretrial motions that the parties wanted heard before Judge Mershon, and in particular, the DA's office asking for clarification with respect to a number of evidentiary rulings that Judge Mershon had made. In doing so and in asking for that clarity, they took us on a tour 
of their case. It was almost like a mini opening statement because we got a preview of all of the ways in which they are going to buttress the story that you and I and many viewers know so well that Michael Cohen worked with Donald Trump to ensure that Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal's stories never saw the light of day before the 2016 election and thereafter worked with Trump and Alan Weisselberg and others to paper it over in a way that we would never know that this is what they had done. But the DA's office yesterday was showing us how are they going to scaffold Michael Cohen as a witness? What are they going to build into that? And so we saw yesterday, for example, a preview of how they're going to use the National Enquirer witnesses. They said in 2015, there was a meeting at Trump Tower by which David Pecker made a promise to the Trump campaign. He was going to do three things. He's going to bury <laughs> negative stories about Donald Trump, accentuate very positive stories about Donald Trump, and also say extraordinarily denigrating things about his enemies. And yesterday, the DA's office said, these are some headlines we want to introduce as evidence of this tripartite scheme. Things like that are how we saw the preview of the DA's case yesterday. So, Chuck, the Judge Mershon immediately ruled against uh, recusing himself. That, that was pushed to the side, that motion, very quickly. So any other motions that stood out to you? And then after that, if you can just speak to the difficulty of picking this jury, if the lead question is, do you have any opinion about Donald Trump, right. arguably the most famous person in the country right now? Let me take the second part, Willie, if I may. You're not looking for people who have no opinion, right? And I'll give you an example. We tried the 9-11 conspiracy in federal court in Alexandria, a few miles from the Pentagon. We, were, we weren't looking for people who never heard of 9-11. We weren't looking for people who were neutral on al-Qaeda, right? People had heard of 9-11, and they weren't neutral on al-Qaeda. We were looking for people who could say, despite all those things, I can listen to the evidence and be fair. That's all you're looking for. You can put aside what you know, what you believe, Watch what's adduced to trial, follow the instructions of the judge, apply the law to the facts, and render a fair and impartial verdict. So I don't think it's that difficult to find a dozen people who can be fair. You may have to ask a lot of people until you find 12, but they'll get there. Um, as for the judge's rulings not to recuse himself, that was easy. There was no basis for it. Um, and I think Lisa very well summarized some of the other rulings yesterday, admitting evidence that the government's going to use at trial to sort of explain the context and the backdrop uh, for why it was so important for the Trump campaign to try and kill this story <clears throat> right before the election. But I, I think as one that knew Donald Trump, uh, <clears throat> Donald Trump, people forget most of us at some point are motivated or uh, try to use the influence of those that we looked up to, mentored us or whatever. He's on his Roy Cohen mentorship right now, which believe that you always look to find one or two of the jurors that can either hang the jury or get you an acquittal. This is why he's sitting there when he could stay awake, trying to stare at the jury. And he's trying to see, uh, at, the, at the prospective jurors, trying to see what kind of rhythm he could get with who may ultimately sit in that box. He's going to be playing Roy Cohen card all through the trial, uh, trying to, you know, use his facial um, uh, expressions and other things to try to discredit without saying anything, people like Michael Cohen and all. So, Chuck, my question to you is how do you... How do you counter that if you're the prosecutor? And how do you deal with the fact that you're dealing with a defendant who is trying to stay out of jail, who's hang, hung around people like Roy Cohen all of his life, and is trying to play the jury as a defendant mm -hmm. when he's not sleepy Donald? Well, right, so all defendants are trying to stay out of jail, so he's not <laughs> unique in that way. But, but you raise a really interesting point, um, Reverend. It only takes one juror to hang the jury. And let me explain that. A jury has to be unanimous to convict, 12-0. It has to be unanimous to acquit, 12-0. But any other combination, 11-1, to 10-2, to 2, means a mistrial. And for a defendant who's looking to run out the clock, right, having a mistrial would be a wonderful outcome for Mr. Trump. Not a conclusive outcome, but a wonderful outcome. It means that if there's another trial, it's months and months away, right. and he might be president again by then. So, you know, that is a hard task for a prosecutor to eliminate from the jury pool anybody who has a hidden agenda. 
by definition, hidden agendas are hidden. And so the voir dire process is an attempt to try and pierce that veil, but it's not perfect. And while I believe, as I told Willie, that you can get a fair jury, it could be the case that somebody ends up on the jury who wants a particular outcome. You ought to try and avoid that as a prosecutor. Yeah, and Gene, we obviously, that, that's obviously what Donald Trump's hoping for. He only needs one yeah. juror who, who decides they're going to, uh, uh, they're going to ignore yep. the, the facts, they're going to ignore the evidence, they're going to ignore the law mm -hmm. and let uh, Donald Trump walk. Yeah, that's exactly what he wants, and he's going to try to, he and I guess his lawyers are going to try to engineer that. My, my question to Lisa, um, just in, in terms of inside the courtroom, aside from the from the interlude when uh, he seemed to fall asleep, um, was Donald Trump really actively engaged, did he seem to be actively engaged with his defense lawyers. How was that dynamic? Is, it, do you expect him to try to play uh, a, a major role in this jury selection process in making those decisions? And from the, from the point of view of his defense team, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think from the point of view of his defense team, look, Gene, nobody wants to be micromanaged by a client ever, particularly a client who maybe doesn't have the best judgment with respect to how he's perceived by others. But was he actively engaged? Yes. And I was particularly struck by the, I'll call it the friendship or the bromance between mm -hmm. Todd Blanche and Donald Trump yesterday. There was frequent huddling, arms around each other, whispering, pointing, constant back and forth. And I will also tell you that Todd Blanche, who joined former President Trump's legal team about a year ago, seems unparalleled now in his closeness to former President Trump. He didn't enjoy that same rapport with two of the other attorneys sitting at the council table, Emil Bove, who's one of Blanche's partners and a former colleague in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and Susan Neckless, who was sitting at the far end of the table and is one of New York's best known criminal defense lawyers. She's extraordinarily mm -hmm. skilled and yet doesn't seem to have that same relationship that rapport that Todd Blanche and Donald Trump have clearly developed. And so I will be looking to that, that interplay. Who is leading who is the key question on my mind. Is Blanche able to get through to Trump and give him his best counsel? Or is this a situation of agency capture where, in effect, Trump's lawyers all become more Trumpy as a result of their association with him? MSNBC legal correspondent Lisa Rubin, thank you very much. We'll be seeing a lot of you, and we appreciate it. Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas suggesting Americans take matters into their own hands when it comes to pro-Palestinian protesters. Cotton's comments came after crowds of activists protesting the Israel-Hamas war blocked roads and shut down business, bridges in major cities like San Francisco, Brooklyn, Seattle, and Chicago yesterday. Take a look at what the senator said on Fox News. I have to say, Sandra, I agree with you that you have to get to these pro or these uh, criminals early. If something like this happened in Arkansas on a bridge there, let's just say I think there'd be a lot of very wet criminals that have been tossed overboard, not by law enforcement, but by the people whose uh, road they're blocking. If they glued their hands to a car or a the pavement, well, probably pretty painful to have their skin ripped off, but I think that's what, the way we'd handle in Arkansas, and I would encourage most people anywhere that get stuck behind criminals like this uh, who are trying to block traffic to take matters in their own hands. There's only usually a few of them, and there's a lot of people being inconvenienced. It's time to put an end to this nonsense. I sympathize with law enforcement having to deal with this, but I, I think it's time for private citizens who are the ones being inconvenienced here when they're confronted with these protesters just to solve matters on their own before the uh, police even show up. Uh, uh, I'm thinking that's a little over the top. I, well, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's I mean, beyond, what? it's beyond that. I mean, police officers would be the first to say, don't do that. Please don't say that. Cop, or do cops, that? cops would say, please don't do that. Please don't say that. Please don't take we'll matters into it. your own hands. Um, Red people's skin off? you know, Mike, um, the few things, uh, well, I, 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 I'll just put it this way. I doubt. Senator Cotton is any more exasperated 
than I am when I see people doing this, blocking blocking people who are going to work <clears throat> or trying to take their kids to a doctor's appointment or trying to to to, to make an airplane at, at O'Hare so they can get home in time to see, to, to, to see a kid's uh, ball game or a recital um, or, or just to get home to the people they love. It's there, there are ways to protest and and uh, there's ways, uh, I, I think, not to protest. And, and this is this is extraordinarily counterproductive to any cause that you're pushing. Um, but here we have a guy, Tom Cotton, that went to Harvard, uh, undergrad and law school, served in the military, um, who's talking about throwing people off the Golden Gate Bridge, ripping their skin off. We had a United States senator going on, on, on a network, national network, suggesting that Americans rip skin off of, uh, of people's hands because they're aggravated um, and to take matters into their own hands. This is, this, is, this is just beyond stupid on his part, beyond dangerous on his part to say this. And, and I must say, this, this goes, Tom Cotton that used to be on this show, pre-Trump, would never have said something like yeah. this, yeah. never. No. Tom, Tom, Tom Cotton that, that we interviewed time and again on this show would have never said anything like this. This shows how violence and, and violent rhetoric has, has, has become normal practice in the Republican Party. These are the people who are preparing for a guy who, who has promised to be a dictator from day one. Listen, nothing is more infuriating, and I could not measure the anger within me if I were disrupted in terms of getting someone to a hospital, oh. a member of the family, or stuck in traffic because of people, what 100%. they did on the, on the Golden Gate Bridge or whatever, wherever it was. But you know what would happen if I get out of my car and grabbed one of the protesters from their cars and threw them off the Golden Gate Bridge? I would be doing 15 to 20 years for manslaughter. There's no doubt about that. Right. That's what I mean, happen. that's what he was saying. That's what, that's what, what, he, that's that's what he, he was said. He said, throw people off the bridge. I wouldn't strip rip, anybody's rip, skin off. Rip their, rip their skin off. But, but it gets to a lot. Eddie Gloud and I were talking just prior to coming out here. There was a poll. As a matter of fact, I have the numbers. There's a poll taken. I was just looking at it yesterday. One third, 34 percent of Americans would like to go and settle in another country if they were free to do so. Half of Americans, 51 percent of those under the age of 35, want to resettle elsewhere, as do 39 percent of those 35 to 54 years of age. Why is this happening? It's happening because people like Tom Cotton and people like the guy who is in trial today downtown Manhattan, yeah. They continually run this country down, that there's something wrong with this country, that there's something going on in this country that is against you and me, average citizens. They have done this. They've, they've roiled the pot in this country to a point where the anger, the unspoken anger of people, the unearned anger of people yeah. has disrupted. Mike, yeah. So Eddie has a new book out today. We are thrilled. It's titled, We Are the Leaders We Have Been Looking For. In it, Eddie looks back at a series of lectures he delivered at Harvard over a decade ago that focused on Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and Ella Baker. Eddie explores the question the trio posed, how to fight for justice in a post-civil rights era and in today's political climate. Eddie writes, quote, at the heart of the book is a simple formulation, almost cliche. If we are going to be the leaders that we're looking for, we're going to have to become better people. Uh, Eddie, congratulations Thank on the you. book. We've been anticipating this for a long time. It is here today. People can go pick it up today. So what did you set out to do? I kind of set the table a little bit, but more specifically with this book, what did you want to say? You know, really what I, I think we've outsourced, really, uh, our responsibility for democracy for too long. We've outsourced it to politicians. We've outsourced it to so-called prophets and heroes. And we've given over our responsibility, our power. And so what I wanted to do, the title actually comes from Miss Ella Baker. And Miss Baker used to say, a strong people don't, doesn't need strong leaders. Right? She wanted us to involve ourselves or engage in politics in such a way that everyday ordinary people, right, involved, in, you know, indigenous to the space, would emerge as the folk responsible for transforming their lives. And so what I try to do in this book is find my own feet, because I'm trying to figure out my relationship to this tradition that made me who I am, 
What does it mean to be a Gen Xer born in the shadow of the 1960s? I think the 1960s, contrary to some folk, those are the, that's the greatest generation in my mind. And what does it mean to be born in the shadow of them and to try to find my own voice? I had to figure out what is my relationship to Do Dr. King? What is my relationship to Malcolm X? How can I find my particular signature voice without paying, but without engaging in supplication to them? And so these lectures are an attempt in some ways to call people to take responsibility for now, to take responsibility for the future. And isn't it true, Eddie, that you, you focus on King and Malcolm and Ella Baker, uh, that they did not start out to be leaders. Mm. They became that because of activism. Dr. King left Boston University and went to Montgomery just to pass the Southern Church mm -hmm. and ran into the situation with Rosa Parks. He didn't plan Rosa Parks and plan to do what he did. Ella Baker uh, doing the work in Mississippi. Malcolm X finding himself after being a convict. And, and I was raised by some of the King men, mentored by him. Jesse Jackson was a student leader that emerged in his staff. So I think that the, the critical part of your book is we are the leaders that we've been looking for, is that's how the leaders we look up to became the leaders. Oftentimes what happens with, with prophets and heroes, they become larger than life. Yeah. We think that they have qualities that are beyond us. And so then what we do is we follow them. And when we follow them, we give up the hard work of working on ourselves. We don't see, Joe, that Martin Luther King exhibited a courage, Doc, that's in me. Right. That this person revealed a kind of character that I'm capable of demonstrating in my own life. Instead, we have this nostalgic longing. Oh, if only we had FDR today. If only we had Dr. King today. No, we need you. And part of the part of the challenge is to rid ourselves from being, you know, engaging in supplication, from being fans in the pews to pastors, as opposed to being in the journey, being in the journey. So this book is a radical call for everyday ordinary people to take control of this democracy and to disrupt a style of leadership which in which we give over our power to folk. Right, to understand that we in fact have the power. It's and we expect too much from them because once we exalt them. You know, like Dr. King didn't say, I wish Thurgood Marshall was in, in Montgomery. He did it. And Abernathy did it. But then we exalt them. Then we look for the flaws and say, oh, I made you this great image. Ooh. And I find out that you don't wash your feet that well. I mean, we look to break down people rather than lift ourselves up. Absolutely. So, so Eddie, this conversation, especially what you were just talking about, the two of you, what has happened to us? Why have we, why have so many Americans lost the memory of what this country was and still is and ignore what the country still is? You know, it's a really important point. Um, I think, and I'm following here the historian Richard Slocken, who has a new book coming out. He says that we're in a second lost cause. Mm. We're in the midst of a second redemption. And what was, what was distinctive about the lost cause and redemption wasn't just simply the violence of Koufax, Louisiana, or Wilmington, North Carolina, in which there was literally a coup in those state governments, over those state governments. It was also, uh, Mike, the assault on what we knew, how we remembered Reconstruction, how we remembered the past. And what's so interesting about it, when I look at what's going to happen to those kids in Florida and Texas and all these places where they're, being, where they're not going to be taught the full scope of our history. I get angry about my children, my black children and brown children having to learn that, but I actually get more angry about what's gonna happen to white children. Mm -hmm. Because you know what? Those kids who were taught in the first lost cause, they turned out to be the adults in Montgomery. Mm -hmm. They were the adults in Mississippi. They were the adults in Louisiana, the folks who actually engaged in the violence of the Second Reconstruction. So I think part of what we're dealing with is what, what Frederick Douglass called Joe, the horrible reptile in the nation's bosom mm -hmm. in 1852 that he said we must tear away and we have refused to tear away that serpent and it's literally eating the nation's entrails today. You, uh, you, you talk about at the heart of this book the need for us to be better people. Yeah. That is something that Republicans used to call personal responsibility. Remember, Republicans yeah. would always talk about personal responsibility, personal responsibility. Now it's victimhood. Mm -hmm. It's them being snowflakes. It's somebody else is picking on me. I would be better, but somebody else is, 
you know, taken my place, it doesn't deserve it, et cetera, et cetera. But again, you say we have to be better people. Yeah. That goes to the heart of personal responsibility. I was don't look out there, look, look here. You know, Jimmy Baldwin has this wonderful formulation, and I'm paraphrasing him here, Joe. He says that the messiness of the world is in fact a reflection of the messiness of the, our, our interior lives. That that southern sheriff who behaves so badly, he's wounded. He's hurt. And so the moral question of who do we take ourselves to be? What kind of human being are you? You know, that, that question you asked right. Tom, Qu uh, Tom Cotton, who raised you? Miss Ella Baker, when she was losing her memory, she to, whenever she would meet somebody, she would say, who are your people? You. Yeah. Trying to locate you, trying to ground yeah. you, trying to put you close to the ground. The moral question, right. regardless of the politics, the moral question of who do we take ourselves to be? What kind of human being are you? Joe, you and I disagree about politics on a number of things. Right. But one of the things I said, I said it on television, you're a decent dude. Right. right. And part of what I'm trying to do is not a post ideological space. But what does it mean to put forward, to foreground the values of decency, love, and care, right, as the basis of our politics? And that, that goes to the heart of what kind of human being you take. He's a decent dude, and he can preach, too. I heard. Yeah, he I heard. <laughs> All right. The new book is titled, We Are the Leaders We've Been Looking For. And Eddie's going to be back with us throughout the week to talk about it further. Such an important book. Thank, Thank you, you Eddie. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you, Mika? Eddie. Thank All right, you. House Speaker Mike Johnson unveiled a Republican-led foreign aid package yesterday. According to three sources familiar with the process, the legislation would include three aid measures with roughly tens of billions of dollars for Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan, and allies in the Indo-Pacific. A fourth measure would include national security priorities such as seizing Russian assets in the U.S. and a loan lease program for Ukraine and additional sanctions on Iran. Johnson says his preference is to vote on each bill individually, but we'll let the chamber decide. Joining us now, Republican member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Congressman Mike Lawler of New York. Thank you so much for coming on the show this morning. So uh, what, are, what are the chances this aid gets through anytime soon? In the case of Ukraine, it has been a long wait. Well, thanks for having me, Mika. As I've said repeatedly uh, since I took office, we must lead. Uh, as leader of the free world, the United States has an obligation to support our allies uh, between Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. Uh, the United States must get the aid and support necessary. Uh, I think it's been a long time coming, uh, absolutely. Uh, but I'm glad the speaker has made the decision to put this on the floor. Uh, while it will be four separate bills, uh, my perspective is I'm less concerned about the process and the procedure and more concerned about the end result. Uh, we need to get aid to our allies. Russia, China, and Iran are not our friends. They're not our allies. Mm -hmm. uh, they have engaged in unholy alliance to undermine and destabilize the United States, Israel, and the free world. And we must combat this malign effort. So I'd love to uh, follow up on that point, um, it, because it might be the case that some um, of your colleagues on the Republican side um, seem to be not in line with that kind of thinking. And I'm wondering, for these four separate bills, for this aid, will you be able to get the Republican members of Congress on the same page to get this aid through? Well, I think what you're seeing, uh, frankly, on both sides uh, are challenges. I think the Democrats have a major challenge on aid to Israel. Uh, we'll see mm -hmm. how many of my Democratic colleagues support that. Obviously, we have had uh, consternation within our conference on Ukraine. But as I have said repeatedly, when you look at what is happening around the globe, uh, these things cannot be uh, taken up as, as silos. They have to be viewed in the context of the, the greater conflict. China is the biggest purchaser of Iranian petroleum. It's why I introduced the SHIP Act last year and passed it through the House. And finally, the Senate will be taking this bill up. It's why yesterday we passed the Iran-China Energy Act uh, to go after the financial institutions in China, which are facilitating this illicit oil trade. 
88 billion dollars in increased revenue to Iran since Joe Biden took office. These sanctions are critically important. You look at what is happening where Iran is the greatest state sponsor of terror. It is using the funds from this illicit oil train to fund Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, and now a direct assault on Israel. Uh, and as I've said repeatedly, you know, my wife is from Moldova. Her family lives on the Ukraine border. Uh, I have no doubt if Ukraine falls, uh, these former Soviet satellite states will fall with it. And that is a calamity that none of us can afford uh, in the United States or in Europe. And so, yeah. you know, we must lead. And if we fail to lead in this yeah. moment, uh, we will be viewed like Neville Chamberlain uh, was in the lead up to World War II. So, so we Congressman, must be Winston Congressman, you're, 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 you're actually you're actually sounding like a conservative Republican. And I haven't heard that out of the House often on, on this issue. <clears throat> and by the way, the Wall Street Journal editorial page is consistently um, uh, chided people inside your conference. Uh, uh, who who have have been pushing back on doing the very things you're talking about right now? Um, sometimes a sense of perspective is needed. And if you could, if you'd be kind enough to take us into the the House uh, uh, conference, <clears throat> and I I understand you you have people that that spout Vladimir Putin's talking points and Russian propaganda, but we also talk about. The House Intel Chair. We also talked about the House Foreign Affairs uh, Chair uh, McCall, uh, who have both been strong, fierce advocates for for Ukraine from the start. And 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 like you, they they take uh, what I consider at least to be a traditional conservative stance. I'm curious inside the caucus, how big of a split is there? Are there? Are there 50 percent, 40 percent, 30 percent who are doing Vladimir Putin's bidding, spewing his talking points? Is it 5 percent? Do, do most Republicans support defending Ukraine against Russian aggression? Uh, it, it is a significantly small number, uh, but unfortunately a loud uh, number. Uh, and I think what you have seen uh, you know, with Chairman McCall's comments, Chairman Turner's comments, and what Speaker Johnson is saying. Uh, the, the Republican conference as a whole, uh, the vast majority of members support Can I ask you, why is it taking, uh, why is it taking the Speaker so long? I mean, Ukrainians have been dying. Why has it been Like, what he said yesterday is what you've been saying all along. Why did it take yep. him so long to get there? Look, I, 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 to be fair to the Speaker, I think he walked into a very difficult situation uh, inherited a conference that obviously was uh, broken, uh, a lot of infighting, and we had a lot of things that needed to get, uh, you know, out the door, including the appropriations package. Obviously, if we want to provide aid to our allies, we need to be able to fund our own government. And so getting the appropriations work done was critically important. Getting FISA reauthorized last week, critically important. Uh, and now here we are with uh, aid uh, for our allies. I would have liked to have seen this done a lot sooner. Uh, obviously, the House passed aid to Israel back in November of last year. Uh, so it is not that we have not moved uh, legislation, but obviously there's been a lot of consternation. When you look at some of the challenges that we're facing uh, across the globe, you know, I, I, with all respect, uh, I think Joe Biden has made uh, several mistakes in the lead up uh, to the conflict in the Middle East, including lifting some of the sanctions against Iran. Iran is the greatest state sponsor of terror, and they need to be held accountable. $88 billion in increased revenue to Iran through the illicit oil trade is unconscionable. That's why I passed the SHIP Act through the House last October. Chuck Schumer and Senate Democrats need to move the SHIP Act immediately so that we can apply secondary sanctions to China, the greatest purchaser of Iranian petroleum. They purchase 80 percent of it. So this is, you know, we have to look at this in totality. It's not just Ukraine. It's not just Israel. It's not just Taiwan. The United States must lead a concerted effort 
to support the free world and take on those uh, whose entire purpose is yeah. to undermine and destabilize the United States. So briefly, Congressman, it's one thing to have this proposed legislation out there from the speaker, these broken out into four parts to get the foreign aid out the door instead of in one big foreign aid package. It's another thing entirely to pass them, as you know, through the House, given the narrow margins you have there. Are you confident that all, some, maybe just Ukraine or any of these will make it through the House? They have to. Uh, and this is where Republicans and Democrats have to work together. Uh, you look at the fact that we are in a divided government. The Senate will have to pass things. President, obviously, a Democrat. Republicans and Democrats in the House will have to work together to pass these bills. Uh, and, you know, the, the Speaker has laid it out. There will be an up or down <coughs> vote on each. People can vote their conscience. Uh, if some of my colleagues are opposed to Ukraine, they can get on the record. If some of my Democratic colleagues are opposed to Israel, they can be on the record. But we must pass these bills and get aid to our allies. If we fail in this obligation, then we fail to be the leader of the free world. Uh, and the consequences of that will be dire across the globe. All right. We'll be watching closely. Congressman Mike Lawler of New York, thanks for your time this morning. We appreciate it. Who's this? That's, this is uh, Secretary Rusk with Dick Goodwin. Dick Goodwin came with us about three years ago. He was Felix Frankfurter's law clerk. He had a brilliant record at uh, Harvard Law School and has been working as an assistant, and he's been particularly concerned with uh, Latin America, which has been a matter of special interest to us. And therefore, our program on Latin America and its implementation now have fallen into uh, Dick Goodwin's hands largely. He works on the messages, too, doesn't he? He works on the messages, that's right. Wow. That is President John F. Kennedy speaking to NBC News in 1961 about a young staffer named Dick Goodwin. Joining us now is Pulitzer Prize winning author, presidential historian Doris Kearns Goodwin. Her new book out today is titled An Unfinished Love Story, A Personal History of the 1960s, part memoir, part biography of her and her late husband, Dick Goodwin. Good one. Doris, it's so great to see what you've written a lot of books. This one is special for all the obvious reasons. So much. We were just talking about boxes and boxes that Dick had from his years serving under President Kennedy. Um, how did you approach such a personal project differently, obviously, than all the other biographies you've written? Well, it did start because he had saved 300 boxes that really were a time capsule of the 60s because he not only worked for John Kennedy, he worked for with Jackie Kennedy. He worked for LBJ as his chief speechwriter. He was with McCarthy, Senator McCarthy in New Hampshire, which was Bobby Kennedy when he died. So he's just like Zelig. He's everywhere there. But he wouldn't open these boxes. It made me so upset because I knew there was great stuff in them because he was so sad at the way the decade had ended. Martin Luther King killed. He was with Bobby Kennedy when he died. And the riots in the streets and the violence and the anti-war movement. Um, finally, he turns 80. He comes down the stairs. It's time. It's time. It's wow. now or never if I have any wisdom to dispense. So we spent the last years of his life reliving the 60s, reliving our youth. I mean, I was in my 70s when he did this. He's in his 80s. And we started with Kennedy. And we went right up to the end of the decade together. You know, at one point, he did show me something out of the boxes. Dick and I were talking about the war and Lyndon Johnson. And he went and got an old speech that he had written for Lyndon Johnson prior to his departure. And he had notations on the side indicating, you know, he didn't know which way Johnson would go on the war, but we now know. What was Dick's mood then that you reflect, re reflected on, having looked at everything in the boxes? his mood toward Lyndon Johnson and the increased escalation in Vietnam. You know, one of the things that happened for Dick and me was that I was such a Johnson loyalist. I had ended up working for him in the last days of his White House and then helped him on his memoirs. And while I had been an anti-war activist, I had such great respect for what he did domestically, Medicare, Medicaid, aid to education, immigration reform, everything. And Dick was a Kennedy loyalist and there was a fault line between the two. So. After the war escalated, he resented Johnson so much. He had loved him so much. He was involved in, in doing the Selma speech right after Bloody Sunday. It was Dick's proudest moment in public life, that incredible joint session speech. And after that speech was over, where Johnson went right out for voting rights, talked about the idea of what America stood for and how we had the freedom riders and the people who were marching were the real heroes. They had made this happen. He said, God, how I loved Lyndon Johnson, how I could never have imagined that two years later I'd be marching against him in the streets. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. That was the moment when, as you know, um, he, he went out when he was working on that speech. He had only that day to work on that speech, nine hours that day. He comes in at nine. He has to be ready at six. 
and he put his watch away as if he would put his watch away. He wouldn't have to worry about time. It was kind of crazy. And he kept working. P pages were going out to Lyndon Johnson, who's screaming outside, but knows that he can't pressure Dick because he's only got that day to write the speech. And then finally he takes a break. He has to have a cigar. Mike and he used to smoke cigars together. And he went out and he heard these young people singing, We Shall Overcome. He came back in and then he added that passage into the speech after he talked about not a northern problem, not a southern problem, not a state's right problem, not a constitutional problem. The constitutional command is clear. It's not even a moral problem to deny your fellow Americans the right to vote. It's wrong. It's dead wrong. And then he was able to say, but even if we get this done, the full blessings will take a lot longer, but we have to fight for it and we shall overcome. And that's the moment when change happens, as you know, Eddie, when the outside movement fires the conscience of the people and it happens. So he had loved him so much and then he got so angry that the war had undone things. But in those last years of his life, this was what, man, you know, you saw us in those last years, Mike. He re retained a, a remembrance of what was great about Lyndon Johnson, what was great about the country before the war. And he began to come to terms with Johnson. Mm -hmm. And and it made him a happier person. It made him feel fulfilled that he had done something that mattered, that the country had done something great that mattered. And it was all still there despite the war in Vietnam. Doris, we have an extraordinary audio clip we want to play for you. This is a 1964 conversation between President Johnson and his press secretary, Bill Moyers. It was this conversation that set the stage for Dick Goodwin's return to the White House, though he wouldn't know it took place until decades later. Since Sarnes left, we've got no one that can be phonetic and get rhythm. Uh, the only person I know who can, and I'm reluctant to ask him to get involved in this, because right now it's in our little circle, is Goodwin. Well, I just asked him if he can't put some sex in it. I asked him if he couldn't put some rhyme in it and some beautiful church Indian phrases and take it and turn it out for us tomorrow if he just won't take off the day. And if we will, then we'll use it. But to uh, ask him if he can do it and talk, just call it tonight and say, I want to bring it to you now. I've got it ready to go. But he wants you to work on it if he can do it without getting in the car. No, I'm not sure he's not going right now. Tell him, and I'm pretty impressed with him. He's working on Latin America already. See how he's getting along. But uh, can he put the music to it? Wow. Can he put the music to it? Can he put a little sex in it? And as, as we said, Dick didn't know that conversation had taken place until much later. What's what do you think when you hear that conversation? Oh, right. I mean, we were like nosy neighbors <laughs> listening on a party line. And he finally realized this is what got me to go to work for LBJ. And then not long after that conversation, Dick, Dick is called to a meeting by Bill Morris with Lyndon Johnson. They want to come up with the vision for what Johnson's program is going to be. He was getting the civil rights bill through, tax bill through. He wanted his own Johnson program. The meeting took place in a pool rather than in the <laughs> office. And they come and Johnson's slim, swimming naked in the pool. Oh, wow. And there's Bill and Dick standing with their suits on. They don't have bathing suits. And he says, come on in, boys. Don't be squeamish. They, as they swim in the pool, he says, I want to have my own program. And they outline what will become the Great Society. And that becomes the first big speech that that my husband worked on. He comes up with the phrase Great Society, but it has in it Medicare, Medicaid, aid to education, all the things that will become the 89th Congress. So it all started naked in the pool, wow. paddling up and down. That's some, some image, Doris. For the history nerds. And, for the history nerds, Mike. And now you know <laughs> the rest of the story. Uh, well, thank you, Doris. Tomorrow we will get to the points we wanted to get to, but uh, this was far too interesting, especially <laughs> figuring out where all the greatest programs of the 20th century started mm. in that pool. pool. All right, thank you. Uh, the new book is an unfinished love story, a personal history of the 1960s. It goes on sale today. And we'll see you again all week, Doris. Thank all you. Week. I'll be conversation. With you. Thank you, thank you. Still all right, 37 past the hour, happening right now in New York City, day two of Donald Trump's hush money criminal trial is set to begin at any moment with the jury selection process resuming as you can see moments ago donald trump uh came in and i guess he didn't say anything he hasn't said a thousand times before so uh we haven't heard anything more it looks the same too joining us live from outside the courthouse in lower manhattan msnbc host and reporter yasmin vesugian this mean what are we expecting to happen today in terms of the jury selection i'm thinking of any ways that the defense can prolong the process would be their goal, maybe. 
Well, and it seems like the jury selection is going to be taking some time, uh, Mika, just to kind of give you some color as to what's happening inside the courtroom right now. It seems like they're going to get up and going any moment now. Judge Bershon is not taking the bench. However, um, Donald Trump and his um, defense team are, are in the courtroom. He did stop in the hallway to speak for a moment. There's just one part of it that I want to share with you because it sets up what we're going to be hearing today. I um, mean, it is Donald Trump's defense, right? The question of whether or not he's actually going to testify. Um, he said, I'm paying a lawyer and he marked it down as a legal expense. I didn't know. He marked it down and said legal expense. That's exactly what it was. And you get indicted over that. That is what he said um, in the hallway. So it brings me to my next point, Mika, which is the Sandoval mm. hearing. Before they move on with jury selection, they're going to get into the Sandoval hearing. And essentially what that means is it allows the defense and it allows the defendant, Donald Trump, to be informed as to what cross would look like from the people if, in fact, he decides to testify, right? So we're seeing and hearing the defense there from Donald Trump himself in that hallway. I marked it down as legal. Um, I paid Michael Cohen. He marked it down as legal expense. My hands are clean, not my fault. After that, we're going to move back to jury selection, right? Nine jurors so far have been questioned. One, in fact, was um, excused on the question of, do you have a strong opinion about Donald Trump? And that juror said yes and was then subsequently immediately excused. Let me just take you through quickly the process here, Mika, of what it's going to look like today. So after those nine, there are two automatic excusals, right? If you have a conflict with the next six weeks or so, you will get automatically excused. Can you be fair? If you cannot be fair or impartial, well, you will also get automatically excused. I want to make sure I'm getting this right, so I'm taking a glance at my notes here. Um, once they get 18 total in the jury box, that is when both the defendants and the prosecution will subsequently ask their own set of questions to those potential jurors within the parameters, of course. They can't, for instance, say, are you Republican? Are you Democrat? Did you vote for Donald Trump? And so on and so forth. They eventually need to get to those 12 jurors. That is the magic number. However long, though, that takes is really the question, Mika. And we're looking at really a two-week possible timeline until they can get a, fur a full jury pool seated. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.